Choices in life. I've always been more interested in creating a character that contains something crippled. I think nearly all of us have some kind of defect anyway, and I suppose I have found it easier to identify with the characters who verge upon hysteria, who were frightened of life, who were desperate to reach out to another person. Tennessee Williams. Thank you. This is, I'm Rob Rotman for Adapt Chicago Productions. One year ago, America celebrated the centennial of Thomas Lanier Williams, but we all know him and love him as Tennessee Williams. On this show, we're going to salute his life, his legacy, and his connection to people with disabilities. So I have invited our favorite guest, Tacky Lemnicki, and of course, the Tennessee Williams of Generation X, Jason Sanicki. Jason Will you please provide us a brief background on Mr. Williams? He was originally, Rob, he was from um, St. Louis, Missouri, and um, he used his family a lot in a lot of his work, and uh, he was known for using topics in his work that um, other playwrights dare not mention, such as um, lobotomies, cannibalism, homosexuality, um, I don't, what, Tucky, what else would you say? Um, uh, disability. Well, okay, disability. Um, um, overbearing mothers. Overbearing mothers. Yes, um, Edwina. Well, no, his mother's name was Edwina. That's the um, the famous thing. And um, his sister Rose is the basis for uh, the character in Glass Menagerie. That um, his sister who had a lobotomy when she was young. So. Right. Before we go on, I should mention that Mr. Williams did attend the University of Iowa, and um, he had an interesting year there. Um, he was not particularly um, admired by Professor E.C. Maybe, the head of the department, who felt Mr. Williams' work was too medical. He rejected a play he wrote by Socialized Medicine. And when he became famous, he did not do Mr. Williams, though he did do work by um, Arthur Miller. So. How interesting that he would do Willie Loman, but not Blanche Dubois. Techie, how do you relate to it? I always related to the Glass Menagerie because of uh, Laura's disability. Um, because my parents actually were, um, I felt, in denial of my disability. When now that I'm older, I realize that you know they just really wanted to make me strong. However, um, as a young woman um, and a, as a teenager, when I first read Glass Menagerie, I so related to her, to Laura, because um, her mom would be like, "Oh, it's just a little limp, just a little." You know, if we had those skirts like back when I was, you know, a Southern Belle. She's channeling Laura Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So anyway, I, I just so related to her in that sense. Plus, here's the cool thing. I loved unicorns, and I collected glass animals as well. So, I mean, I felt like so much like her. And I just longed for a gentleman caller to come over and, you know, sweep me off my feet. The line's behind me, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I've always wanted to play Laura in the Glass Menagerie. I thought that would be so interesting for her to be a little person and for her mother to really deny that she had any kind of disability. That, would be that, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> yeah, but now that I'm older, I'd probably, probably play Amanda. I, I think I'm a little bit long in the tooth to play Laura. But, uh, Rob, you did ask me about writing my own, um, about my own family. And it's a tricky thing because, especially if your family's still living, you know, they could get really mad about, <laughs> about what you say. I mean, um, my mom has come to grips with, um, my work now and talking about my dad who was quite the colorful character and swore and everything <laughs> and um i mean at one point she said techie can't you let the dead rest and i'm like no mom tennessee didn't let the dead rest no so anyway it's a tricky slope but it, it's well worth it because i think the best stuff comes from your own experience thank you um 
Jason, I guess now yes. we have to ask you. What I know you're not a big fan of the glass menagerie. Why? Well, why am I not a fan of the glass menagerie? And I better be careful or else Tuggy will hit me with a cane. Um, I'm not a fan of a glass menagerie because I think it's a, it, I think the play is too sweet. I think the play is too um, too American for most people. And I had to read it in college. Um, in um, uh, in an English class, I took him a drama, and it was actually good. And I've actually seen it done live before, and um, I still don't care for it. Um, and what are your well. favorite plays by Mr. Williams? And what play? How? Do you, why do you identify with him? It definitely would have to be um, the Streetcar Named Desire, which I think is the greatest play ever written. And I'm, why I'm, is that? Why? Because it's just, it's a very interesting. Um, Idea. It was a very interesting idea, and you have to remember the time it was written in, and how he wrote it with a with a, um, the story being the woman that goes to live with her um, sister and the brother-in-law, and the brother-in-law is this to um, borrow from Mr. O'Neill, this hairy ape kind of a character. Um, but basically, um, it's just a very interesting way, and it's kind of like they're all in a boxing match or a wrestling match because they're all in that one little apartment in New Orleans. And um, she, and Blanche comes to town, and she totally um, upsets the apple cart, for lack of a better term. And um, and it's all the... the um, the um the conflict between the sisters and him and um the conflict between the fact that Stanley can see through w to who Blanche really is and where the rest of the world just, just sees Blanche as this Scarlett O'Hara knockoff from the south from the south but it's it's a phenomenal play and it's another one that I've seen done live um and Techie would you like to do Blanche I would I would yeah. really like to and do how Blanche would you play her? Oh, no, no, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I'd like to to do it with the mix of fragility, you know, and and yes. yet oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. and yet have that underlying well, well, kind of. Well, the whole thing with a lot of the, re the reason that I love the streetcar is because um, also – in the era that he wrote it in, in 47, it was very taboo to talk about homosexuality. And we really figure out why, you know, why she left her teaching job to come live with Stella. Because, I mean, you, you, know, the, you know the story and, and the whole thing about, um, the, about that she walked in on her husband in bed with another man. And, and those just were things that were not talked about back then. And I know, Jason, you're a big fan of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And why? And yeah. Well, because I've always felt a little like Maggie the Cat at some time in my life. But no. Um, but I love Cat on a Hot Tin Roof for another reason. Um, because it's all, it's very Southern, very, um, well, a lot of his work is Southern because, you know, New Orleans and whatnot. But it's very um, genteel, and it's very um, Maggie. The, Maggie the cat is this um, this woman who takes no for an answer, and and she won't, no, she won't take no for an answer, and she's very um, you know st stiff back, very like the Iron Lady, for lack of a better term. Um, thank you, Meryl Streep. But um, and I love um, the character of Brick is really cool because. Basically, the name is his name in the show is named Brick, but basically he's like um, pudding, because basically if you get and you, and you find out what he really is in real life and how his whole thing with his friend Skipper and the whole you know is that really that was his lover and Maggie was the one that was trying to you know dare I say it convert him. <laughs> But and I love the um the Big Daddy the the whole um, relationship between Big Daddy and Brick is so is so volcanic when you see it and the, the, the film itself is amazing the Burl Ives portrayal and um I love Big Ma and Big Mama I feel so bad for her all the time because she's so put upon by him and so for lack of a better term emasculated and, yeah, and if I can interject mm -hmm. something that and Techie, I want to ask you if you were going to do the role I think some people see Big Mama as a figure of pity but by the end she is a very strong woman mm -hmm. I think she is yeah, I, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. well she, co she comes out because the whole thing about 
about Hutch and Roof is that it's all about, um, obviously, if you know the show, you know um, mendacity. There's a lot of mendacity smell in this house. And it's all about lying and about how they all lie to Big Daddy and they say, you're, you're well, you don't, your cancer's gone, it's a spastic colon, it's, you know, nothing like that. And basically, but basically what it is, is, is that he is sick and they were all lying to, like, protect him from himself and save him from himself. And I think at the end of it, Big Mama does come to terms with it. And it's just, it, and it's just, it's such a gut wrenching performance just to watch the, the film itself. I I saw the African American production of it, with Terrence Howard. Thank you very much, but um, and James Earl Jones, who I think who played Big Daddy, and I thought talked like he had marbles in his mouth the whole time. I couldn't understand a word he was <laughs> saying, but it's a. And I directed in college. That was the other thing. That was my yeah. big my big. Tennessee Williams Perfect. moment. That. Um, I've been in Chicago 25 years, and I can't believe how much Williams' work is done. And I know um, the head of the University of Iowa Theater Department now, Alan McVeigh, always says that when he does Shakespeare, he doesn't do Shakespeare as a revival. I do him as a playwright writing today. Techie, how, if you were going to direct, let's say, um, Streetcar, what would you direct, how would you make it to connect it today? I think I, that would be really cool. Maybe I'd do it in a, in a modern setting. You do a, would you set it in, in New Orleans? or would I'd you still do, set it okay, there. You'd set it there. I think I it mean. needs to be there. And there's a line at the industry car, um, the second to the last line, when Blanche is being taken off to the mental institution. Whoever you are, I have always depended upon the kindness of strangers. I know Mr. Williams thought that line should get laughs you know, when Blanche says it. Yeah. Techie, I know this wow. is one of your famous favorite lines. favorite lines. Why? Well, it's one of my favorite lines because um, I uh, used to travel a lot for business, and being a person with a disability... <laughs> I would often need a lot of help and would just simply ask strangers, you know, for whatever I needed, like, oh, could you please reach this for me? Or can you, I even asked a stranger once to lift me into a taxi. And one of the women that um, I traveled with said that I reminded her of Blanche and always relying on the kindness of strangers. But I think that's important. I think it's important to be able to ask for help well, in that. Way. Well, well, of course. But I don't think he. I mean, I know he didn't. I have a feeling, Tennessee didn't write it thinking about. Oh well, there's going to be a little person in 55 years who's going to read my work and be a, you know, and and think of it that way. But I, it's just very, you know. She says, whoever you are, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers, and obviously, if we know the show, and if you know, Blanche's character, how she's so out there and she's so far gone by that time that you know she thinks that he's coming to take her to the prom you know she doesn't realize that you know five seconds before that the guy's talking about oh well we need to cut these nails because where's she going she's going to the loony bin but but I've actually I had a, um, an experience using that line after I saw it in New York um, and then the next night I saw another um, piece that we all know and love um, who's afraid of Miss Wolf or Virginia Wolf in other words George, dinner with George and Martha and I was um, going to dinner before I was seeing Virginia Wolf and I was w crossing the street going to the restaurant on the other side of the street and I was carrying my ticket for Virginia Wolf and I tripped and fell and of course um, stupid here trips and falls and everything goes flying and of course so, um, and, and me turning on the Blanche Dubois saw some um, men walking toward me and I thought, well, only in America w would you be able to tell people that you saw this play the night before. And they helped me up and they, I dusted myself off and I just said, whoever you are, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. And of course, these are um, big, um, hulking, straight, 20-something-year-old um, boys who wouldn't know... Um, the name Stanley Kowalski if it came up and bit them in the nose, but I, I thought it was, I just thought, you know, how many times in your life are you going to be able to say that line to somebody? But I think, you know, for me, it's just, you know, trying to make connections and why I really like writing famous people because 
I feel if I do that and if I tell them what their work has meant to me or what their life, exactly. that it makes me feel exactly. validated. Right. So. Tacky, I understand you once met Mr. Williams? Or? I think it was um, like 79 or 80. Mm -hmm. And I was in a restaurant in downtown Chicago with a bunch of uh, friends. And all of a sudden, I looked over and there was Tennessee Williams eating in the same restaurant, wearing his, one of his signature white suits. And everybody, I was there with a bunch of gay men, and they're like, oh, my God, do you see who that is? And blah, blah, blah. Oh, like, oh, why wasn't I there? That's because I was too young, yeah. but, you know. And I'm like, oh, I have to go to the washroom. So I... Uh, and I walked past. <laughs> I walked past, and I just—I didn't say anything, but I just like brushed up against him, thinking, "I hope some of that rubs off on me, some of that talent." But I didn't—I did not at that point in my life. I was in my early twenties, have the nerve to talk to him. I wish I had. That, that was like the night that I saw producers in Chicago, and and. Um, Mel, Mel, Mel Brooks and Ann Bancroft were in the restaurant next to me, and I so badly wanted to walk by um, and, and, and pass Ann and say, excuse me, Mrs. Robinson, but are you trying to seduce me? But then my friend's like, honey, I'm sure she's heard that a zillion times. Yeah, and for me, I think one of my favorite <clears throat> Williams performances was at the Goodman Theater during Night of the Iguana, during the high school matinee I was ushering. And I remember my friend Steve Scott saying, you know, how are high school kids in the mid-90s going to relate to Tennessee Williams. These kids were so impressed by that production, and mm. especially the star, Sherry Jones, who is a diva. And I, and I met her, too, but that's another story. So neat that, um, that here these kids really responded to those words. And um, as my um, friend Austin Pendleton would say, what would we do if, if his characters never came into the world? I think we're about out of time. First, before we close, I just want to thank Sandy Shinner, Victory Gardens at the Biograph Theater, a theater when it was a movie theater. I'm sure Mr. Williams saw a movie or two during his many years in Chicago. Let's not forget, Glass Menagerie premiered at the Civic Opera House in 1945. So, and, and one more thing, Rob, before we go. Next year, for those of you, those of you that live in Chicago or that know um, Chicago theater itself, um, the Lyric is going to be doing the opera the Andre Previn version of Streetcar with uh, my dear um, friend, uh, Miss Fleming, Renee Fleming, is going to play the role of Blanche Dubois. So one more thing. Um, you know, everyone thinks the last line in Streetcar is whoever you are. I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. But one of the poker players says the game is seven cards stud. Techie, this is a wonderful quote that kind of relates to disability. And, and just I, I think it sums up what, what, you know, how you have to accept life and who you are. There comes a time when you look into the mirror and you realize that what you see is all you will ever be, and then you accept it, or kill yourself, or stop looking in the mirrors. Thank you. I want choices in life. Choices and rights in my life. 